capsule of phosphor along with me. And in addition to that, uh, Shane actually uh, teaches uh, young women how to use IT in the context of his work with AFNOG. Uh, here at the years, we have actually been monitoring and tracking how many women participate in our courses. And while occasionally we have blips that take us up to as high as 40%, uh, usually we have less than 10%, especially when it comes to higher level technical courses. Now, within the framework of open source software, uh, we see that there are a lot of community projects, as anybody who knows anything about open source knows, that one of the most important dimensions of open source software is that it allows you to unpack the technology and actually figure out how that technology works. And so it's immensely useful in building skills. But in addition to building skills, it also builds other, uh, let's say, in addition to building technical skills, it also builds uh, soft skills uh, which um, include being able to understand how to use an open collaborative environment and then uh, teamwork, uh, online, working online effectively. There's so many additional skills. So speaking from the point of a view of a woman in technology, I'm very concerned that we are not seeing enough African women in open source communities. Now, when we talk about the situation, um, many people, young women will tell you, it is because home, we are simply too busy to be hanging out all night, figuring out how some technology works. Everybody knows that men are very lazy they don't do anything in the house. Shayun, can you hear me? <laughs> All right. I'm I'm glad. <laughs> I just wanted to check we were online together. And so um, because men are generally not very active in the home, they have all this free time. So they just reallocate time from watching football to participating in open source communities. Now, the other thing young women will tell you is there is no way that their mother is going to let them out of the house until 2 a, uh, 2 p.m. Uh, 2 a.m. I should say, hanging out with people on the basis that they're unpacking a technology. But to that, I always say that participating in an open source community, as long as you can get some bandwidth at home, you don't have to be physically together. Um, and then they will say, but the situation in Africa is such that there are very few uh, households that really have enough bandwidth to do anything technical on. I'm listing out these things so afterwards Shane will tell me whether or not he agrees with me or not. But here um, at the center we have a lot of uh, discussions uh, which are around uh, the facts that um, is it women who are restricting themselves or is it uh, something societal? Is, uh, are we going to blame society for the fact that women are not participating actively? Or is it something that is really inside women's heads? Um, there was one very famous incident, the head of Harvard who implied, uh, the former head of Harvard, I should say, who implied that the reason that women are not very successful in sciences is something to do with the wiring in their brains. So it will be good to hear from a man whether he believes that there's something fundamentally different about women's brains that stops them from participating in FOSS communities. Uh, but then young women will also tell us things like, oh, my brothers don't want to have a sister who is in technology. It is not cool. They lose status with their friends. Um, that, you know, being a geek is not an ambition, 
which is suitable for a woman. So there are a lot of issues there, but as I was saying, um, in debating with the lecturers here at the Kofi Annan Center, one of the concerns has been what we can do to actually encourage more women uh, to participate. I want to remind us that even if it comes to very um, basic content issues, for example, uh, Wikipedia, uh, you see that the percentage of women contributors to that open source project is relatively small. It's been well documented. And um, there's a, a report that came out a few years ago from Hillary Clinton and Sherry Blair, and they were talking in terms of even very basic access to um, the mobile platform. Uh, do as many women as men have access to uh, even the mobile phone? So perhaps when we look at open source technologies and women, perhaps what we should be doing is looking at it within the broader of how equal is women's access to uh, technology in general, you know, just simple, simply in terms of access for use, before we start looking about how uh, women are involved in actually creating technologies, because through open source communities, women would be given the opportunity to create technologies. So let me stop at this point and invite Shane to give a few comments. What's been your experience? And then I'll go back to what we do at the Kofi Annan Center and explain some of the special programs that we have here for women and whether we think this is enough uh, to build bigger and better open source communities or if there are some other steps we can take. So Shane, let me invite you to comment now. Okay. Thank you very much, DG. Um, okay. Um, thank you very much, Dorothy. Um, hello, people. Yes, we can uh, hear you. All right. I just want to I want to start off by giving an a scenario. Recently, we had there's an event that we normally have every year. It's called um, Software Freedom Day, and um, we normally run trainings and um, hands-on workshop on free and open source software. We ran the last the last one we did was in September last year. We're going to run the one. For this year very soon and what we experienced what we, what we observed in that training was that we had about um, we did it in a different way this time around because we put a little fee on it for the training part of the of the event and we had about 70 percent of the participants were actually surprisingly women young women and i was wondering why did we get more women participating this time around than the men? Was it because we put, because when we were not putting fee, we had men more than women. But now we had fee on it, and surprisingly, we had women more than men. And these are very technical trainings, like, um, well, not, let me not say very, but they are technical trainings like network management and monitoring. You know, people were, the women were there, and we had an award, whether it was a woman that won. And it was so surprising. But um, that is because it's a university environment. I want to think it's because um, my institution, in my institution where I work, um, they've kind of, um, the management has kind of placed value on, um, on capacity building. And it's, it's, it's been a challenge to the women to, um, to want to be able to meet up with the requirements of the university. Um, I wonder how it's going to be like if it's going to be if it's if they don't have anything at stake. Um, if they don't have anything at stake, in the sense that um, the it's not dependent on the progress of their job. It does not. It's not going to affect um, what they take home. It's not going to affect their take home. Um, I want to believe, maybe I want to um, think that the women that actually participated that time, um, they are either participating because of two things. One, 
they want to ensure that they become they remain relevant in the university and they don't want to lose their job because part of the things that they are doing is that they want the um, we are using the capacity training program the university is using it to also um, get the staff to be upgraded in their work if they don't if they don't show sign of capacity uh, building capacity skills then they don't get recognized and being promoted especially in the area of uh, because we are using e-learning a lot to some extent so um, the other the other possible reason could be they just want to um, show show men that they are actually also part of this whole thing they want to prove to men that they can actually achieve even what beyond what they are what they are um, what men are currently achieving well in that case i think it's a big challenge uh, it's a big um, challenge to even women and it's a big challenge to um, um, to women that are actually not um, within the university environment how do we um, get because the participants will although we open the program to everybody in nigeria but we only have participants within the university settings and that is also a sign that um, those that we are interested are interested at those that actually want to use the thing don't which actually see the need for the thing so my guess my my conclusion was that perhaps women who are not really getting involved in IT, they are not actually seeing the need to get involved mm. in IT. They are probably not seeing something that is at stake for them in involving IT. They just be they are just thinking all that it takes is um giving um giving birth to two or three children and uh, taking care of them and that's all. Um they are thinking that all that is involved as a woman or as a growing lady is to one day get married and um, once I'm married make sure that there's food on the table for my husband as Africans and uh, that is what they are thinking so it, it, it takes getting them out of their comfort zone because I see that zone that they have now as their comfort zone get them out of their comfort zone to let them understand that there has to be something that is more valuable than just sitting in that house and becoming a full-time housewife. They have to they have to see something that is more um, more interesting. And um, IT is interesting. I must tell you, <laughs> I enjoy <laughs> IT, and I think it's very good to to be good to um, to get uh, more women. We are working, we are looking to get you more of you guys to, to come into IT and we are ready to support. And we are actually doing that with AFNOC. Um maybe I can if I've got some time. How much time do I have? Um if I've got you some have more time. Like two more minutes. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I can just talk about AFNOC. AFNOC is um, a network operating group in Nigeria, in Africa. What we do is what they do is um, do trainings. Um, annual trainings and there's a there's a, there's a there's a child of it called Af, 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 um, Linux Chicks. Linux Chicks was established uh, was founded a few years ago, and it's targeted towards women. You know, providing trainings for women, and this brings me to also come to the fact that some women also are not coming out because they feel it's a unisex program. And so some of them feel they, they 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 may not be their voice may not be heard the the men's voice may be louder than the, their own voice in the in the program, and so that was the reason for Linux Chicks. Linux Chicks was to have there was to have an avenue where there's a common ground for everybody, at least everybody there probably are packed. At least the Linux Chicks team try as much as possible to ensure that those that are, are presenting or are instructing are also women. But at times we may not get the skills required for uh, for the instructors to be women, so we may have to be it may have to be a guy that we instruct. But we ensure that the participants are women, so that perhaps they can also feel the commonness. Maybe when they feel the commonness, they feel among and they want to um, share ideas together easily. So that was the essence of Afnot Chick, and um, 
I think it has been a, it has been a great success. Um, and um, only if we can have something like that, even at the national level, because they have not the nearest chicks is uh, at the continental level. Maybe it will provide more avenue for women to uh, to know that there is a room for them, even if they don't want to mingle with the guys. They don't want to mingle with the men. They should know that there is a room for them where they can mingle alone and still keep learning IT. Yeah, <laughs> that will be all well, for now. Oh yeah. Well, I hope you'll be coming in again on this. But if I can. That the social messaging that women are getting is that the value of a woman in African society is very much linked up with her ability to marry and have children. Yeah. And so yeah. there's some work that has to be done in changing that social messaging. Yeah. And one of the programs that we found which could be very effective in this is actually an initiative which um, came out of the Middle East from United Arab Emirates is uh, before, uh, during the school holiday period uh, to try and explain uh, to women how um, getting involved with um, getting their children enrolled in courses that will allow them to have a career in information technology uh, could be useful. So the main thing is to open the minds of um, the people who have the most influence on young women, which generally in our society happens to be their mothers or their female relatives. So one of the focus areas is to now brief mothers and mothers of teenage girls or women who are about to enter university on what the benefits of their children participating in open source communities could be. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm, you know, uh, generally I think with time and increased population density and income levels, we'll see the importance attached to having many children uh, as we've seen in other societies is probably going to diminish. But mm -hmm. I don't think that choice has to be between technology or having children. We shouldn't put the choice in those terms. In those terms, yeah. Yes, the issue has to be if you are a young African, the quickest way to get real IT skills is to understand about technologies that are not sold to you in a box that only one person or one group of persons can look at, but which are freely shared so that you can remix, redistribute, do so many things with and actually grow your mind. So I think we need to start from there and do better advocacy so that people understand the difference between what is an open source technology and what is a closed source technology. And when we are talking about these things these days, we're not just talking about um, software, we're also talking about the whole open movement, we're talking about creative commons, we're talking about open education resources, we're talking about open data. So un getting a better understanding of the open movement on our continent, I would say would be uh, a very important uh, step in this process. And we also have to remember that when it comes to commons, uh, this is very much part of African society. So we understand what uh, being part of the commons is and what it means to share and share freely so that the entire community uh, can benefit. So in, in that respect, I have to agree with you, Shane, that the messaging that is going out to women uh, can influence the fact that they are not seeing that um, this is a huge need why should I get into technology? You know, um, and in our society, IT in general, we have to work on it becoming, um, getting the same kind of priority letter, uh, level for parents as we see with uh, medicine, engineering, and law. There's a little way to go for people to understand exactly how important information technology is today. Now, the second thing is to do with whether or not women need to 
for them to participate effectively in technology. And it's very interesting. Um, for a number of years now, we've been running special programs for women in tertiary institutions. And these are exclusive programs. And uh, most of the time, women do tell us they prefer to have an exclusive program. They don't want any men in the room because they'll tell you that if they have to share a computer, the man will always push them aside. He will want to be the one who is behind uh, the keyboard. And uh, they're saying that they just want to be able to chill and relax and not have uh, men around. Uh, there are a few women who will say, oh, it will be boring without the men. The men spice up the action a bit. But we find very similar attitudes when it comes to uh, young men. They are not particularly interested in having any young women in the room when they are being trained. More conscious, especially if uh, their trainer is a young woman. There's a whole lot of gender dynamics going on there. Uh, so we do have to take that into account. But the reality of the situation is that most of our learning environments are mixed. And um, we are talking about a face-to-face -face learning environment in that case. What we need to be those communities, many of those communities are online environments. And is there something uh, in the online environment and the culture, the community culture around open source that is also sending messages to women that they don't, they are not really, uh, you know, welcome in those spaces? Uh, when it comes to the U.S. culture, um, we hear of specific behaviors in open source communities like not having a shower for a long time. Uh, making sure you wear the same clothes for several weeks, uh, not washing your hair, generally um, epitomizing the height of geekdom. But mm. then uh, there is no correlation, I believe, between not having a shower and being able to write good code. Mm. You know, so uh, I don't think that we have to take the culture which is pre prevailing in. Uh, some of uh, Europe and North America, I mean, uh, please excuse me if anybody from North America or Europe is watching this uh, because these are just hearsay and I have no proof of them. Uh, but I think that the main thing um, keeping women out is they are not getting that message, as Sheung said, that this is important for them and it's going to make a difference in their lives. Uh, so one of the things that we do is to, as we are working on innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, make it clear to them, especially for mobile environments, uh, especially the Android environment, how useful it is to be able to develop apps that are relevant to the African markets and using an open source technology like Java to code for Android is a skill that you need to develop and that you can develop uh, to a higher level uh, using, um, you know, by, by participating or creating your own panel last week and uh, one gentleman from the open source community says he becomes very dubious, he's not very much keen on a formal education encouraging people to participate in open source communities. He sees that more as the true geek outside of formal education who believes that, uh, who believes in the technology. But here at the Kofi Annan Center, we actually encourage our students, wh whether they are men or women, to build an open source project and create their own little community around it to see whether they can attract anybody to their idea, what they are proposing, and build their own community. So you don't necessarily have to go for a very complex and huge open source project as we see with Ubuntu, which so many of us use. Um, you can do a simple open source project which can be the duplication of something that you saw uh, let, let me say not duplication, but a tweaking and improvement of something that an idea that you saw on SourceForge that maybe you're not feeling confident enough to participate in 
but you are already observing and lurking. You know, so I, I think that um, at that level, uh, we can definitely encourage women to get into the community. And I am not seeing anything specific in these open source communities that would discourage women from participating once they are there. So I think, Shane, your point is that they won't even go there because they don't see that it is necessary and helpful for them. So once they are there, they will feel at ease if they can gain the skills. But the question is, do they actually espouse the open uh, philosophy? Because if they are getting involved with open source uh, just to build skills rather than give something back, and this is a general problem within the African open source community. Uh, we do see a lot of good things on open source, but how many of us are actually contributing code and giving back, uh, you know, to the open source community? So I'm very happy that um, a company like Main One has donated a hacker space uh, in the Lagos Innovation Hub there. And we are going to be launching a similar innovation hub here in Ghana very soon. And we hope that with our hacker space, uh, we will see more women uh, participating. Um, but the thing is, uh, one of the very interesting things that you mentioned is to do with how we link capacity building in IT with actual advancements on the job. And the question is, in Africa today, given the very, uh, let us say that at the back end, we see a high level of penetration of open source. But most people do not understand the difference between open source. That in their day-to-day -day lives, they are using open source technologies. It's a little bit like uh, there's a play by a French author, Moliere, where the guy wakes up and he says, you mean I've been speaking prose all my life? He didn't realize that just by talking, he's speaking prose. So it's a little bit like that with open source. When you tell somebody that actually, uh, you know, an end user, that you're using open source every single day, every time you click on your Mozilla browser, you're using an open source technology. Every time you use your Android phone, you're using an open source technology. It's a revelation to them. So the question is, for those who are entering the tech space as a profession, are we actually seeing a validation of uh, open source skills? That if you have skills in open source technologies, you will be able to command, uh, say, a higher um, rate of yeah. remuneration, a higher status, in terms of recognition of your superior technical skills, mm. or uh, is the state of the situation on the continent now a high level of ignorance on the part of those people who are actually uh, doing the recruitment and hiring people? And what we have found out is whether it is closed source or open source, uh, we see that many hiring managers actually do not understand how to recruit technical personnel and they are still stuck in the degree game and so they will think that somebody with a PhD in computer science has uh, a superior uh, has worked 10 years on a similar technology to the technology they are deploying so I think that this also could be of influence to women because you were saying that the experience from your um, training was even when you charged fees, you got more women once they understood that it is going to help them in their career. Yes. So Sheun, let me ask you a very specific question. Do you believe that knowing more about open source technologies will actually help people in their career? Um, well, I would say yes and I would say no. Yes, because um, that will work for an institution that has a leadership that already appreciates open source. Hmm. 
if the administration of the institution already recognizes open source and they are already deploying open source in their system, then it is very, very likely that knowledge in open source application and experience in open source by an employee will definitely um, affect the um, the um, the upgrade of the staff. Mm. And I'm going to say no because if reciprocally, if the establishment does not have interest or does not seem to be using open source, it's just like um, Cisco certification. I'm not really promoting any um, platform here, I'm just picking one. Like Cisco certification is recognized and used because um, a lot of people know it. They use it in their system and so because of that the organization um, we definitely employ uh, and uh, upgrade any person that has such certification. Such certification. So I I think it's it's um, it's it's the percentage of an organization recognizing false experienced people as against the percentage of uh, uh, organizations rec recognizing. Um, non force based experience um, people is, um, I would say, 20 to 80. Mm. If I'm not being, if I'm not being, uh, so I, I think, well, I, well, I think, um, at least um, I can say from my own institution, we are encouraging open source, we are using open source, and so we need more open, open source experienced people, and so that's why we, we. We find it very, very um, um, valuable to us when we get more employees that are technically um, sound with open source. And because we want to get more codings, we want to get more coders, we want our computer science to get and uh, to bring out more softwares and so on and so forth. But this does not apply to all institutions, I must say. And uh, mm. it applies to just a few. And getting, getting, um, more institutions and actually the place the easiest way to um, one of the easiest way to, um, place to promote open source is in the educational system um, because that is actually if you ask me one of the foundations of um, force um, but nowadays in this part of our world um, force development in the institutions is uh, is um, is not increasing at the pace at which it, it should be, it ought to be. So um, I think it has started. We've started the development and I think as time goes on, it can only ascend at this stage. Um, mm. The rate can only ascend, it can't descend any longer because um, proprietary software won't come to open source anyway. And so the the the, the People will continue to see, and I think the the the, um, the economic meltdown is also a plus. Um, if you ask me, it may not be a good news for some, but it's a, it's a plus indirectly to some for some because people have now realized that they don't have much money to to, to spend on force on the on the um, proprietary based systems, and so they are indirectly um, um, now interested in knowing. What is this force? Because they want to spend less. So, it, as time goes on, gradually people are getting to understand that what they have actually been paying a lot for can be done with a little. And so they have, especially educational systems now, are starting to in my in, in where I come from from Nigeria, starting to appreciate the fact that because it's open source does not mean that it's one thing that will not work. Mm -hmm. And so they are starting to realize that um, things can be much, much better and processes can be done much better while they save some money to build classrooms and uh, probably give scholarships to some more people. 
Uh -huh. mm. So the more we have such, I think she mm, so you're touching on it. Yeah, you're yeah. touching on a very sensitive point here, um, because uh, always when we talk about this uh, cost component of open source, uh, you will tell people will say that. But what is the total cost of ownership? That uh, Africa does not have enough people who are trained on the open source technologies to be able to deploy them effectively and yeah. therefore uh, the cost will be higher and uh, we should uh, if we want to make any progress we should spend all of our budgets on buying uh, proprietary, proprietary softwares, softwares. Uh, which come ready-made in a box and we, which very often are not well suited to our environments um, it's a big debate which is out there um, but I think that when we look at FOSS for Africa, we don't have to just look at the budgetary issue. While I always tell people, just as you've done, that um, if we want to deploy information communication technologies effectively within our educational systems, given our demographic, uh, a huge dependency ratio in that more than 50% of our populations are actually teenagers, uh, the volume of um, technology required in the classroom in order to support teaching and learning is such that really open source solutions are the only solution. And I'm really happy that you emph emphasize that we have to get more open source technologies in the classroom, uh, not just for the computer science students, but also for every single student because there are a lot of great applications there to help them to learn. Um, but I think that the other dimension of uh, the open source which is so important and which is why we are concerned as to whether or not uh, we have enough women in open source communities is the fact that using open source technologies allows you to develop your skills, allows you to truly own the technology and get to the level where you can develop new technologies on top of what you have been given access to and then contribute that back to the global commons. For me, that is extremely important because many of the contexts in Africa are so different from those environments that the localization of technology is really, really important. And if you're waiting for a vendor to localize, uh, it's going to take you quite a bit of time. But when you throw it back to the community, you see that the community can really invest in making sure that you have what you're looking for. You're growing the ability of your population to understand the technology. And at the same time, you're helping somebody to earn a living. You're helping them to create a new business to support. We were just discussing the deployment of the National Fiber Backbone here in Ghana and the importance of having a whole new set of network engineers to support the rollout throughout the country. There will always going to be need for troubleshooting at the local level uh, for the local area networks that will be riding on it. Uh, what are the technologies they should uh, have uh, a good knowledge of? How will they know which applications to build which may be of relevance to the communities that they find themselves? All of these are really significant contributions, I believe, uh, when it comes to the difference between uh, the deployment of proprietary and open source technologies can make a huge difference. So while I agree with you that there's the budgetary concern, an African government which already has 40% of its budget going to education even before the IT rollout can obviously not afford the millions and millions of dollars of in recurrent licensing fees uh, that vendors are charging. And while we sympathize with the vendors, has to be to their shareholders. I think that uh, as African governments and people within the FOSS community in Africa, our only uh, loyalty is to our people and what FOSS can do in terms of making sure that we are ready for the 21st century. 
And so I have uh, with me in the room who just joined me, one of my colleagues who has uh, consistently been um, battling with me, Shemu, uh, I have invited Ernie to join us in audio. Uh, he, uh, his, his assertion, Ernie, can they hear you? Yeah, can you hear? Can. Yeah. So Ernie, Ernie has always believed that the reason that women are not more involved with force is because women if you could t share a little bit about your views on this and what we can do to get more women into force. Oh, the, audio, the audio is now good enough. Mm. Mm, the audio. Okay, hold on a second. Hello? Yeah. You can hear me. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so the argument we have on is that uh, there are two fronts. On one side, we have to look whether the environment in which we develop open technologies are suitable for women. And then the other one is that we've done a number of experiments to try and encourage women to participate in engineering and technology in general, IT in particular, and open source specifically. And we have seen constant drawback by, by uh, women groups not being interested uh, in participating. I think there's a lot of hype in anything concerning programming or mathematics or software, uh, <laughs> which uh, they tend to shun away from uh, and look for other sectors that they, f they think might be easier. I don't know where they got that idea from anyway, but that's something that we have to deal with. Uh, but uh, on the first point I was making is that also, for example, the, the hacker culture, the uh, garage type of work, uh, these environments often are not suitable for women to participate in. Um, men can go several days, they may not even be bothered whether they have gotten the bathroom or not and all kinds of uh, situations, which uh, tends to be acceptable for men and very difficult for women to cope with. So it, as soon as those type of conditions uh, begin to prevail, there's a tendency that women will shun away from that. So yeah, on one hand, I think we can improve the environments that we develop for creating uh, open source software. We have to try and modernize our hacker spaces. And then on the other hand, we also have to see how best we encourage women and then uh, get the whole community away from the, the, the notion that anything uh, technical or IT related or, or reverse engineering related uh, it's so mathematical and so difficult and that they should look for other businesses to do. Well, um, Ernie is usually more radical in his views. He's being very diplomatic. Uh, usually he says, oh, those women, they are just lazy. They are not willing to make the effort because it really takes concentration and dedication to work well uh, within the open source community. Um, but I think that he's right in that there is, uh, he touched on something that we ignored so far, and that is the general fear of mathematics. Uh, I don't know if it is the same in Nigeria, that many students are afraid of maths. What do you think, Shaun? <laughs> maybe, maybe I may be guilty of that too. Because when I was younger, <laughs> when I was in the university, somehow I was actually also part of the people, the students that were afraid of maths. Anything that has to do with maths, I'm so scared. I just wonder, how do I get the I results? mean, I grew up... So, so yes, yes, people yeah, are, people are I, scared I think, of... Yeah. yeah, so people are, people are afraid of... People are people are scared of the fact that um, of the let me not call it the fact of the the talk that um, coding and IT stuff can be very very difficult and so uh, probably what they are doing at home or what is it that the women are doing is probably easier than that but fine I don't think um, I think that does not just apply to women it applies to even the men and so. Um, even women, some men still feel that Linux is uh, is one taboo that uh, 
cannot be touched. So I think uh, that fear is probably reducing now. And uh, I think uh, the fact that it cuts across the, the sex means that um, it's something that both is experiencing. It's not really uh, peculiar to the women, um, neither is it peculiar to the men. So I think it's something that is at the moment reducing. Um, that fear is reducing, especially since people are now seeing that uh, force is actually something that uh, is more interactive now, and um, one can easily um, get things working as soon as possible, especially if you are not going into, um, for those that are on the user end of, of force, who are not really going into more of programming. So yes. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so people are afraid of math, so perhaps um, while we are talking about the general societal issues to do with women and their role and the fact that they're being uh, still encouraged to become uh, baby producing machines rather than uh, contribute in the workspace, I think that another fundamental issue that has to be addressed is that fear of mathematics and that idea that I think the demystification of technology in general. Uh, so I think that all of us have to make perhaps more efforts uh, to ensure that um, we demystify technology by having, uh, not just on Software Freedom Day, come in and let's um, let's start a fellowship let's have some coding fellowship and let's start having some probably there are some thinking there are some great ideas that we have been missing and you guys are just coming are just supposed to come and uh, fill in for us for us guys eh? so um, to the women and to the to those that have been carrying some question mark on force who are women all this while. Please, I hope this session has been quite informative for you and I hope you leave this session and become inclined to IT. I wish you all the best and thank you, DJ. Well, thank you, Shayun. I, I think it was very useful that we had uh, a young, I don't know if you classify yourself still as a young 
person. Definitely, I am. <laughs> I think you are a young professional, and you are a certified geek. <laughs> so uh, I invited you so that we will have the geek perspective and um, the pers perspective of your generation, because your generation is really in leadership in Africa at the moment. Uh, you are the majority, and you have to take the leadership. But if I uh, summarize very quickly what we've been talking about, I think we've recognized that there are societal pressures that make it less of a priority for women to get involved with technology of any kind in every, any area. And that this becomes heightened when we are talking about open source technologies. In fact, when we are talking about ICT in general, because there are additional uh, prejudices and uh, a level of mystification of mathematics and programming and that we need actively to demystify uh, mathematics, we need to demystify programming. Uh, here uh, at the Ghana India Kofi Annan Center of Excellence we've been training even children in junior high school how to program, we've been training children um, uh, even in primary schools, we see that they can pick up programming skills very, very quickly. And perhaps by having more of such programs and targeting some of them to women, um, we will be able to uh, make sure that uh, we'll be able to make sure that uh, you are able to get young people who are entering the job market, who are already interested and committed to uh, information technology. Then we spoke a little bit about the problems of the hacker community. While uh, Ernie is one of the advocates that uh, because hackers don't bath, women don't like them, I believe that uh, women can have their own hacker spaces. There's nothing stopping them from building their own communities around tech to also understand a little bit about how people work collaboratively um, to see if there are any special skills transfer that is needed for women to become more effective there. Um, then we've talked about the link between participation in open source communities and rewards uh, which are beyond just uh, knowing that you built a, built a beautiful technology. Um, making sure that the general environment is positive towards open source technologies and that people will get additional uh, monetary rewards also when they get involved in that space. Of course, when you have your, you know, the killer app that you develop making you lots of money because the whole of Africa is using it, you will definitely love open source technologies, but very often people using those applications don't understand that they're using an open source technology and so it's not helping uh, promote that. Maybe we should have a little Africa brand sticker. This is an African open source technology made in Africa by Africans for Africans. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I don't know, we'll have to discuss that at the level of phosphor. Uh, but I think that you also mentioned and I'll agree with you, Shane, that it's very useful to have exclusive spaces for women so that they can gain confidence during the training period and uh, really grow. So I see that we have very few minutes left now. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank the organizers of this conference. Today is International Women's Day. We are part of a huge global, uh, a global conference with participants from all around the world coming on as their time zones become activated. And uh, this session is being placed on um, their YouTube channel and people will be able to watch and re-watch. What we've tried to do in the session is to be very frank and candid about the issues which are facing women in technology in Africa. I'm sure we could have said a lot more uh, we could have talked about the computer grabbing more that takes place in universities by men. Uh, but gradually we are making sure that every woman in higher education should be able to have their own device 
so mm -hmm. nobody can grab it from her and it's a question of how much time she will invest in it and whether that time will be f uh, spent doing uh, social networking or it's going to be spent developing your ability to develop technology and create new technology. So I want to thank Global Tech Women for the opportunity and I'm hoping that eventually many young African women will watch this session or at least parts of it and that you will understand how important it is and we will understand all of us all the different things we need to pull together to make it so that this kind of discussion about African women and open source technologies will appear very peculiar to young women in future because they will totally own that space. Thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of the Global Tech Women International Women's Day Conference. See you soon, Shane. We are expecting you here in June. Yeah, thank you, Dorothy. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.